Thank you. Yeah, wonderful to be here. If you want a copy of Warriors Alive, I've got a bunch of them over there, and I've paid this gentleman handsomely to tell you what he thinks paid. of it. It's so, a brilliant book you should buy. Uh, uh, thank you to uh, thank you to Bruce Kent and the movement for the abolition of war. Bruce, raise your hand. Who? Uh, brought me here and we've been having some very useful meetings um, and to Veterans for Peace and to the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, um, uh, Stop the War Coalition, I think, spread the word about this. Um, whoever I'm leaving out, thank you, thank you. Um, I've been to London, I think, three times and always to this building uh, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great place. I like it. Um, I, I'll just talk briefly and then uh, I hope Ben is going to speak uh, about from Veterans for Peace and then we'll discuss. And uh, let me start with this. In eight days, July 10th, Mary Ann Grady Flores, friend of mine, a grandmother from Ithaca, New York, is scheduled to be sentenced for a year in prison. Probable sentence, uh, a year in prison. Her crime, violating an order of protection a legal tool to protect a particular person from the violence of another, for what a, what a beaten wife would get at a court to protect from a husband. But this is a commander of Hancock Air Force Base who has been legally protected from dedicated nonviolent protesters despite the protection of commanding his own Air Force Base and despite the protesters having no idea who the guy is. So they can run into him in the grocery store and violate the order. Uh, this is how people in charge of flying killer robots that we call drones want to avoid what they are doing entering their minds, entering the minds of the drone pilots. This is how badly they want to shut out the protests. Last Thursday, a place in the U.S. called the Stimson Center released a report on this new U.S. habit of murdering people with missiles from drones. The Stimson Center is named for Henry Stimson. Anybody remember him? Yes. U.S. Secretary of War, who prior to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor wrote in his diary following a meeting with President Roosevelt, quote, the question was how we should maneuver them into the position of firing the first shot without allowing too much danger to ourselves. It was a difficult proposition, end quote. Four months earlier, a guy named Winston Churchill had told his cabinet at a place called 10 Downing Street that the U.S. policy toward Japan consisted of, quote, everything was to be done to force an incident, end quote. This was the same Henry Stimson who later forbid dropping the first nuclear bomb on Kyoto because he had once been to Kyoto. He had never visited Hiroshima, much to the misfortune of the people of Hiroshima. I know there is a big celebration of World War I going on over here, as well as big resistance there too. But in the United States, there has been an ongoing celebration of World War II for 70 years. In fact, one might even suggest that World War II has continued in a certain way, on a lesser scale, for 70 years. And on a greater scale in particular times and places, including Korea and Vietnam and Iraq. The United States has never returned to pre-World War II levels of taxes or military spending, never left Japan or Germany, engaged in some 200 military actions abroad during the so-called post-war era, has never stopped expanding its military presence abroad, and now has troops permanently stationed in almost every country on Earth. And two exceptions, Iran and Syria, are regularly threatened. So it is altogether appropriate, I think, that it was the Stimson Center that released this report by former military officials and military-friendly lawyers, a report that included this rather significant statement, quote, the increasing use of lethal UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, may create a slippery slope leading to continual or wider wars. At least that sounds significant to me, continual wars. Pretty bad thing. Also last week, the U.S. government made public a memo in which it claims the right to legally murder a U.S. citizen, never mind about anybody else, as part of a war that has no limit in time or space. Call me crazy, but this seems serious as well. What if this war goes on long enough to generate significant enemies? Last year, the United Nations released a report that stated that drones were making war the norm rather than the exception. 
That could be a problem for a species of creatures who prefer not being bombed. The United Nations, created to rid the world of war, mentions in passing that war is becoming the norm rather than the exception. Surely the response to this sort of development should be equally significant. But we have grown habituated, I think, to reading reports that say things like, if we don't leave 80% of known fossil fuels in the ground, we are all going to die, and lots of other species with us. And then reading the recommendations section of the report, where it says, use efficient light bulbs and grow your own tomatoes, we, we have become used to the response not remotely fitting the crisis. Such is the case with the United Nations, with the Simpson Center, and with a good crowd of humanitarian law experts, as far as I can tell. The Simpson Center says of murders by drone, they should be, quote, neither glorified nor demonized, nor apparently should they be stopped. <coughs> Instead, they recommend reviews and transparency and robust studies. I am willing to bet that if you or I threatened massive, continual, or widening death and destruction, we might be a little demonized. I'm willing to bet the idea of our being glorified wouldn't even come up for consideration. The United Nations, too, thinks that transparency will solve this. Just let us know whom you're murdering and why, and we'll get you the forms to do a monthly report. As other nations get in on the game, we'll compile their reports and create some international transparency. This is progress in people's minds. Drones are, of course, not the only way, or thus far the most deadly way, that the U.S. and allies wage wars, but there is this minimal pretense of ethical discussion about drones because drone murders look like murders to a lot of people. The U.S. president goes through a list of men, women, and children on Tuesdays, picks who to have murdered, and has them murdered, although often also targeting people whose names are not known. <coughs> Bombing Libya or anywhere else looks less like murder to many people, especially if, like Stimson in Hiroshima, they've never been to Libya, or if numerous bombs are all supposedly aimed at one evil person whom the U.S. government has turned against. So the United States goes through something like the 2011 war on Libya that has left that nation in such a fine state without it occurring to any military-friendly think tanks that there's an ethical question to be pondered. How, I wonder, would we talk about drones or bombs or so-called non-combat advisors now going into Iraq if we were trying to eliminate war rather than ameliorate it? I think that if we saw the complete abolition of war as even our very distant goal, we would talk very differently about every type of war today. I think we'd stop encouraging the idea that any memo could possibly legalize murder whether or not we've seen the memo. I think we'd reject the human rights group's position that the UN Charter and the kellogg briand Pact should be ignored. Rather than considering the illegality of tactics during a war, we'd object to the illegality of war itself. We wouldn't speak positively of the United States and Iran possibly joining hands in friendship if the basis for such a proposed alliance was to be a joint effort of killing Iraqis. In the U.S., it's not unusual for peace groups to focus on 4,000 dead Americans and the financial costs of the war on Iraq to the United States and to steadfastly refuse to mention a half million to a million and a half Iraqis killed, a silence that has contributed to most Americans not knowing that that's happened. But that is the strategy if you're an opponent of some wars, not if you're an opponent of all wars. Depicting a particular war as costly to the aggressor doesn't move people against war preparations or rid them of the fantasy that there could be a good and just war in the days ahead. It's common in Washington to argue against military waste, weapons that don't work, weapons the Pentagon didn't even ask for, congressional corruption, or to argue against bad wars that leave the military less prepared for potential good wars. If our project was aimed ultimately at war's elimination, we would be against military efficiency more than military waste. We would be in favor of an ill-prepared military unable to launch more wars. We'd also be as focused on keeping young people out of the military, of militarism out of school books, as we are on preventing a particular batch of missiles from flying. 
It's routine to profess loyalty to soldiers while opposing their commander's policies. But once you've praised soldiers for their supposed service, you've accepted that they must have provided one. Celebrating World War I resistors, as I know some of you have been doing recently, is the sort of thing that ought to replace honoring war participants. We may need to not just change our conversation from opposing specific war after specific war to discussing the ending of the whole institution. We may also need to alter at least subtly every part of our conversation along the way. Instead of proposing that veterans in particular have earned our gratitude and should receive health care and retirement, which one hears in the United States where those things don't go without saying, we may want to propose that all people, including veterans, have human rights and that one of our chief duties is ceasing to create any more veterans. Instead of objecting to troops urinating on corpses, we may want to object to the creation of the corpses. Instead of trying to eliminate torture and rape and lawless imprisonment from an operation of mass murder, we may want to focus on the cause. We cannot go on putting $2 trillion a year globally, and half of that just from the United States, into getting ready for wars and not expect wars to result. With other addictions, we are told to go after the biggest dealers of the drug or to go after the demand by the users. The dealers of the drug of war are those funding the military with our grandchildren's unearned pay and dumping buckets of money into propaganda about Vietnam or World War I. They know that the lies about the past wars are much more important than the lies about new wars. And we know that the institution of war could not survive people learning the truth about it to such an extent that some people begin to act on that knowledge. U.S. public opinion has moved dramatically against wars. When Parliament and Congress said no to missiles into Syria, public pressure of the past decade played a big role in that. The same is true of stopping a horrible bill on Iran in Congress earlier this year and of resistance to a new war on Iraq, whether uh, oh, a new war like Iraq, whether in Iraq or elsewhere. Her vote to attack Iraq 12 years ago is the only thing that has kept us thus far from seeing Hillary Clinton in the White House. People do not want to vote for someone who voted for that. And let me get this said early to our dear friends at the Nobel Committee. Another Peace Prize will not help anything. The United States does not need another Peace Prize winner making wars in the White House. It needs what Bruce and so many of you have been working on over here, which is a popular movement for the abolition of war. A number of peace activists have started up a new effort called World Beyond War. And you can check out the website at worldbeyondwar.org, and I'll pass around a, a sign-up sheet with the two-sentence statement that we're getting thousands of people, 58 countries so far last time I looked to, uh, to sign, and if you want to Pass that around and take a look. And if you have a pen, add, uh, add your name and uh, info. Um, the idea is to bring millions more people into peace activism who haven't been in it yet. So we're signing up neighborhood groups and environmental groups and civil rights groups and individuals uh, who haven't been part of opposing particular wars. And, see peace and the ending of the institution of war not as more radical, but as, as more acceptable, as necessary, uh, as progress in the world. Um, it, certainly some people are going to see this proposal to end all war as more radical, uh, but others are not. And so that there's a potential here of bringing a lot more people into a movement that goes after the institution of war uh, as well as assisting in going after each particular war. Um, our, our hope is that by bringing more people into the movement, we can strengthen and enlarge rather than compete against existing peace organizations. Uh, the website, worldbeyondwar.org, is intended to provide educational tools. We have videos, maps, reports, talking points. We make this case against the idea that war protects us. An outrageous idea, given that the nations that engage in the most war face the most hostility as a result. We have anti-US terrorist networks. We don't have anti-Canadian terrorist networks. 
um, because of which war is, which nation is out there fighting the war on terrorism, as they call it. There was a poll at the start of this year, polled people in 65 nations, and one of the questions was, what nation is the greatest threat to peace on Earth? Any guesses? <laughs> you know, in the U.S., I say that, and people can't guess it. <laughs> do, you know, do you know what nation, do you know in the U.S. what nation led in that poll? Iran. One percent of the U.S. military hasn't launched a war on anybody in centuries, uh, hasn't threatened to launch a war on anybody, has never had a nuclear weapons program, been lied about for 30 years. This is the power of U.S. television. Uh, the greatest threat to world peace is Iran. But the rest of the world, far and away, second place, not even close, the United States, greatest threat to peace on Earth. Uh, U.S. veterans are killing themselves in record numbers, in large part over what they have done to Iraq and Afghanistan. Our humanitarian wars are a leading cause of suffering and death for humanity. And so we also refute the idea that war can benefit people where it's waged. You know, a majority of Americans think Iraq benefited from the war that destroyed Iraq. We, we also lay out the arguments that war is deeply immoral, a first cousin of and a frequent cause of, not an alternative to, genocide, that war destroys our natural environment, that war erodes our civil liberties, and that just transferring a bit of what we spend on war to something useful would make us beloved rather than feared around the world. One and a half percent of what the world spends on war could end starvation on Earth. War has taken 200 million lives over the past century. But the good that could be done with the resources dumped into war far outstrips the evil that could be avoided by any war. For one thing, if we quickly redirected war's resources, we would have our best shot at doing something to protect the climate of the planet. That our concept of defense does not include that illustrates how far we have gone toward accepting the inevitability of what is, after all, the perfectly avoidable and perfectly horrible and completely indefensible institution of war. Having accepted war, we try for cheaper wars, better wars, even more one-sided wars. And what do we get? We get warnings from respectable war supporters that we're beginning to make war the norm and risking continual warfare as other nations get into drone killing. On the one hand, this looks like a case of unintended consequences to rival those who sought the truth about God's creation and ended up with the guy who's on the money around here, Charles Darwin. On the other hand, it's not unintended at all. A professor at Stanford University has just put out a book arguing that war is so good for us that we must always keep it going. That strain of thought courses through the veins of our military-funded academia and activism. But that kind of thinking is increasingly unpopular. And this may be the most And crystallize into action the growing popular sentiment against war and the realization into which we stumble that particular wars can be prevented. And if particular wars can be prevented, then each and every one of them can be prevented. So I look forward to working with you all on that project with the urgency that it demands uh, and I hope we can all work on it together. Thank you for inviting me.